So let me start. Uh, why, why don't you each just take one minute just to introduce yourself and just tell us what you've been doing for the past 10 years. Why don't you Steve, okay. start, then Victoria, and then Kim. Steve, why don't you start? Oh, what I've been doing for the last 10 years. Well, yeah. <clears throat> lots. let's see. Um, this year, today, I heard that, uh, and my article was, study was published in Nutrients, a big journal. And uh, that's on uh, modifying diet to reduce risk of Alzheimer's disease, where I'm the senior author of only two authors on this paper. And we, we nailed it on which foods increase and decrease the risk of Alzheimer's disease and all the mechanisms why. Uh, not going back quite 10 years, but last November, I published a study on advanced glycation end products mm -hmm. and their, um, uh, how they, have, basically, if you reduce eating the advanced glycation end products, what happens is your brain starts working better because the neuroinflammation goes down. And then this past month, I just published one on lipopolysaccharides, the most inflammatory molecule around. And that's found, um, well, in animal products, let's say, uh, meat, chicken, fish, and, and cheese, and so on. But I mean, 40 nanograms is enough to blast your inflammation up in your body and in your brain. And people are eating over a million when they have um, you know, cheese casserole. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's that's my last three months. I think that's enough for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hey, everybody, I'm Victoria. And in the last, gosh, 12 years, I went from being just Victoria Moran to being Main Street Vegan, wrote that book, Main Street Vegan in 2012. And that was followed by the Main Street Vegan podcast, which is out there and has been for all this time. And uh, Main Street Vegan Academy, where I train and certify vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. And we have Main Street Vegan Productions. We did the film in 2019 documentary, A Prayer for Compassion, about spirituality and food choices. And we are now working on a feature film, which is incredibly exciting, a wonderful story with a dazzling surprise ending about a cow who escapes from a slaughterhouse. And also in the past 10 years, back in 2016, I was voted PETA's sexiest vegan over 50, and I'm now 74 and didn't think this was going to be 74. Nice to be here with everybody. Thank you. Well, hi, I'm Kim. Um, and gosh, in the past 10 years, I basically turned my life from standard American diet to whole food plant based. So um, really, it's um, I've been uh, I started my business five years ago. So really, in the past five years, um, I, I went from, you know, on my own journey of eating whole food plant based and kind of started my blog to really kind of hold myself accountable, put my recipes out there in my journey. And it was kind of in that process, I was like, I really want to share this with more people. And so I quit my teaching job. Now I just teach online <laughs> um, and um, started my business and um, um, my program, Plant Powered Life. I've got over 1,500 members um, in that program and they're just doing amazing. I uh, wrote my book, Plant Powered, um, because people kept asking me, questions about eating plant-based and they just wanted to know everything. I was like, well, I can't tell you everything in five minutes, but maybe if I just kind of download my brain and put it in a book, I could hand it to you. And so um, published that um, last June and that's been in the uh, Amazon bestseller in the vegan diets um, category since it was published. So yeah, that's uh, kind of what I've been up to. Great. Thank you. So to start off, uh, Victoria, you said you turned 74. What I did, yes. <laughs> um, what has surprised you in terms of health and your body and how you feel and everything about being 74 that <laughs> a 45 year old might not realize? Well, I think it starts uh, about 50, you know, certainly for women with menopause. I woke up at age 50 and I thought there had been invasion of the body snatchers because. 
I felt like I went to bed with a nice flat stomach and a nice round bottom. And I woke up and it was like, wait, did those get turned around? And then I started looking at middle-aged women, you know, at the gym and it's like, you know what, that just happens. And of course you can do, you know, you can work your abs and you can do these things, but there are certain things that are just hormonal and they just happen. And the cool thing about being whole food plant-based is that we're forestalling so many even genetically determined problems that could come up to the point that either they don't happen at all or they happen later. But we're still getting older. Little things like, okay, you expect your hair is going to turn gray, so you'll either love it or you'll color it non-toxically, of course. But what you don't expect is gray hairs in the eyebrows and out your chin, you know, and it's like, okay, whoever said old age is not for sissies was a genius. So it's this beautiful dance of acceptance and doing everything you possibly can on the physical level to live as youthfully as long as possible. Great. Thank you. Um, Kim, you have used the phrase progress, not perfection approach uh, for adopting a plant-based lifestyle. What exactly does that mean? And why do you use that phrase? Yeah, I think um, I, I say that, first of all, because I needed that myself, because I'm I am a perfectionist. And that's good and bad. Um, the bad part is, is when you can't meet perfection, which is unattainable, then you feel like you failed. And then the only other option is all the way the other way. And I find that a lot of people that somehow come to me and find me are kind of in the same boat. You know, they want to change their lives. They want to do all these things, but there's, they've been in this, you know, diet mentality of yo-yo back and forth, got to be perfect, can't be perfect. So I'll just eat all the terrible things. And it's this kind of black and white that people kind of get stuck in. And so to get them to uh, feel successful and kind of in, in get more confidence and continue improving all the time, I find that just changing our mindset to more of rather than black and white, right or wrong, perfect or not, let's just try to be better every day, a little bit better. Progress, not perfection. If you mess up, it's okay. Get back on the web wagon. If you're just spend every day beating yourself up and shaming yourself for every mistake, you're going to be, you know, you're not going to be successful, successful like that. It's just this negative loop that's never going to stop. And so that progress, not perfection is all about having a positive, loving and graceful, you know, have gr having grace for yourself through, you know, changing your habits, changing your lifestyle, learning all these new things, because it is hard, you know, it's not always easy. And so you've got to have kind of a, a more positive outlook rather than like, well, I wasn't perfect. So I'm a failure. I'll just give up, you know, so progress, not perfection. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Blake, you have a lot of things, a lot of books, a lot of things in your resume having to do with memory and dementia and Alzheimer's. So after doing all this research and focusing on this area, um, what is the bottom line? None of us want dementia. None of us want to lose memory. So what is the protocol? What exactly should we do to protect our memory, our brain and our cognition so that we don't lose it? Well, yeah, uh, it's nice to see you again, Stephen. It's you too. <laughs> Um, yes, keeping our brain sharp. That's what I do. I work at the Maui Memory Clinic with people. And, and I agree with Kim Murphy that uh, we don't, when we see people, turn them into instant vegans. We help them to move toward a more healthy diet. And um, it's amazing how that can help, how much it can help just to ease the load a little bit on the brain. For instance, one lady came, she's a pharmacist. And uh, she had post-COVID uh, loss of concentration, basically. And so the first time we saw her, her, when we asked her a question, there was a delay. And then she could barely put the words together. Well, we got her to change a few things in her diet. She went a little bit more plant-based. And a month later, the delay was less, really noticeable. And one month later, no delay. And she was starting to speak and talk. And we see this all the time. And when quizzed, it turns out she's still eating meat and all kinds of uh, not healthy for the brain things half the time. So I look at that as room for improvement. Just think, 
what could be in her future. And as she sees and her husband sees the improvement, then she's more committed to want to go further a little bit. And in answer to your question, Stephen, I just learned that today the nutrients review article that I'm senior author of came out. And uh, it's out of preprint and in nutrients. We got through peer review. And that's on diet's role in modifying the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Pretty much exactly what you asked me. And that's now um, a free article for anyone to view. And the biggest risk factors we found um, looking very carefully were meat and processed meat. Those are the two biggest risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and also mixed dementia and vascular dementia. So those would be the top ones. And of course, all the other animal foods you could toss in there too. If, you know, I mean, it'd be pretty easy if you wanted to get Alzheimer's disease, what to eat. And pretty easy if you didn't want to get Alzheimer's disease, what to eat, uh, except for, you know, compliance issues, the people's ability to change their diet and uh, how that can happen. A whole food plant-based diet would be ideal. And it's not just food, of course. Uh, we do find that stress and anxiety make it difficult for people to think. And I actually have a nutrition protocol for people that reduces anxiety and it's incredibly effective. And you'll never guess, it's a plant-based eating. <laughs> and uh, same one for depression, you know, it's a little different, but it comes out about the same. Uh, we do encourage people to do uh, active mental work learning. And so um, our neuropsychologists can assign games to them like card games of memory, or if processing feed is slow, ways to speed that up. And physical exercise is also highly recommended for getting better perfusion of blood, oxygen, nutrients into the brain. So that's like the recap uh, a little bit, kind of recap. Thank you. Okay. Um, Victoria, um, you have an acronym for living well at every age, a kind of formula for life. What is it? Yeah, it's MEND. You know, I had a grandmother who with a needle and thread could make any kind of rip or tear look like it had never been there. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if we could mend our lives the way she used to be able to mend a garment? And I was thinking, we really do have those tools in this whole food plant-based lifestyle and a way that I have come up to remember them and, and practice them every day is M-E-N-D. M is meditation. And that's a really, it, certainly classic meditation has so much uh, going for it in terms of the literature, but it's really also a catch-all for stress management, focus, quiet, calmness, what, taking care of our emotional, attitudinal, mental self. E is exercise, which is practically a panacea. The amazing things that can happen with exercise, particularly now that we understand that on an evolutionary level, that the body, it takes care of us because the brain gives us the message, this person is viable, this person is moving. So secrete your hormones and, and mount your immune defense, which it wouldn't do if we were just being sedentary. And then uh, N is nourishment, which is what we're all about. When I first came up with this, I said nutrition, but I think so many people interpret nutrition as little bottles in a vitamin shop that nourishment is certainly what we eat and all the beautiful colors of, of a plant-rich diet. And even the way that we approach food, like uh, drinking your water in a stem goblet instead of a plastic superhero's cup from the Taco Bell. I mean, it's just a whole other experience, makes you feel better about yourself and it's another way to be nourished. And D in the MEND program is detoxification, which means certainly we can do detox kinds of things. There are all sorts of interesting programs. Heaven knows I've done plenty. But what I really think about in terms of detoxification is living every day in a way that helps those organs and systems of the body taxed with detoxification to be able to do their job well. So this is things like just not getting ourselves so toxic to begin with by eating certainly low on the food chain, eating plant-based, uh, organic whenever possible, using natural products. And then also part of, of detox is sleep. 
and sleep hygiene so that we can take care of that wonderful third of our lives. Thank you. Um, Kim, uh, can you provide an example of a daily meal plan that is both satisfying and nutritionally complete for a plant-based diet? Ooh, let's see. What did I eat today? <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, we've been kind of on the overnight oats train because um, they're so easy to batch prep for the whole week. And so um, this morning I had my um, overnight oats with apples and cinnamon and walnuts. So got the healthy omega-3s. Um, and then let's see, lunch was leftovers from last night. We I made... Um, it's kind of Southern and it's kind of first of the year thing, but we like to have it more often because I just really like it. But black eyed peas, cabbage and cornbread uh, mm -hmm. is kind of a Southern tradition for good luck. We always eat it on the first of January, but um, I, we usually have it every couple months. Um, so that's what I had. So huge plate of food. I also actually had um, some uh, white bean chili. I had a, a little bit of um, potato and white bean chili um, with that as well. I ate a lot. Um, and then let's see, for snack, I had some clementines and some grapes. And then for dinner tonight, we had uh, pumpkin pasta. Um, so lots of vitamin A, beta carotene, um, spinach in there. Um, yeah. So lots of, lots of really hearty food that, and, and I love eating this way because I eat, I eat until I'm full. Um, so that's just something that's really helped me stick with it because I'm not eating tiny portions or portion control or calorie counting. I'm eating and listening to my body and, you know, listening to the signals it's telling me. And if I'm hungry, I eat, if I'm not hungry, I don't eat. Right. Kim, well, can I just jump in and yes. ask how you make your cornbread? <laughs> So actually it was the plant strong cornbread. So I do have a cornbread recipe uh, in my program, Plant Powered Life, but um, I did actually, cause they just came out with the plant strong, just came out with the cornbread recipe and a whole bunch of other stuff and pancake and waffle mix. So I bought a whole bunch of their stuff to try it. And it's really good. So I recommend their, their cornbread mix. Uh, Kim, one more quick question. Just the people sometimes say that eating whole food plant-based diet is too expensive. Um, I guess it depends what you buy and where you shop, how do you respond to that? Yeah, I I find it actually less expensive um, because I'm I'm buying staples. I'm not buying the processed foods, you know, the the fake meats and the fake cheeses and all the different newfangled things on the market. Yeah, those are expensive. Um, but so is meat and dairy and other processed foods. Those are expensive. And so when you cut those out and you focus on whole plant foods, things like beans and grains, you know, those are some of the cheapest foods. It's, even if you did, especially if you do dry beans, which I usually do canned beans for convenience, but dry beans are like, a dollar for a pound, you know, they're so cheap. Um, and then I do lots of frozen fruits and vegetables. So you can, you know, and because what the biggest thing waste that people expense, I should say, is food waste. 40% of the food we buy at the grocery store, we throw away. So if you can cut down on food waste, that in itself is a huge savings. And so using lots of frozen fruits and vegetables and they're flash frozen at peak ripeness. So you're really getting, you know, all that nutrition locked in there. And then they last, you know, and they're there when you need them and you can throw them in the microwave or steam them or cook them however you want. And it's a huge savings. So my family of four, when we first went whole food plant-based, I saved hundreds every single month on our grocery bill, you know, so our bill went down. Now, when you first start out, you may have to buy some extra spices and some things that you're not, you know, kind of fill up your pantry. So that in the beginning might be an initial, if you don't already have some kind of basic things like that, it might be an uh, extra expense. But I mean, I, I find that it's actually a lot cheaper. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Blake, um, what has your real world experience been? In other words, for the people that eat whole food plant-based diets, do they all live to 100 in perfect health? Do they still get heart attacks? Do they still get cancer? Do they get diabetes? Do they get obesity? Like, well, I, I understand the theory and I understand it's better than this standard American diet, but what's actually happening? Are people still getting diseases? Are they getting a lot less? What is your real world experience with actual people that do follow this and also the ones 
that don't, but specifically the people that do follow this? Well, if people are really eating whole plant foods and a healthy diet like that, um, it's not quite that simple. Uh, we also need to keep our saturated fats below about 12 grams per day. If people are doing both of those things, then what we see is that the blood cholesterol goes down and the risk of heart attacks goes down and the clogging of the arteries goes down. So the risk of strokes and heart attacks just kind of bottoms out there. It may take a couple of years for uh, cholesterol of 280 to go down to 180, and then maybe a couple more years to settle down a bit further. But that's a huge difference. As you don't have plaque in the arteries, it's really much harder to get a heart attack or a stroke. So the real world thing is that you're becoming stroke proof and heart attack proof, and it takes a little bit of time. Also though, that's really helping your brain in a lot of different ways. I think inflammation is one of the things that really is a problem for the brain, neuroinflammation. And we see that when people drop advanced glycation end products in my recent paper on that, and when they drop the lipopolysaccharides paper that just came out, uh, that I, I was lead author of both of those, uh, we see that people's brains sharpen up rather quickly. So you can't say they become Alzheimer's proof, but you can say their memory is better, they're quicker, their executive functioning is faster and more exhaustive. And so basically they're getting younger instead of older. And I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. you, you just mentioned not having saturated fat. If someone's eating a whole food plant-based diet, what foods should they be avoiding in the whole food plant-based world that you would consider having too much saturated fat? We don't use the word avoid usually. We usually use substitutes. Um, but coconut oil is found in many of the plant foods. And coconut oil is the highest in saturated fat, about double that of lard, for example. Uh, really nasty stuff. I don't know why it's so popular. It has no vitamin E. It has no essential fatty acids. It's worthless nutritionally. Uh, just a bunch of calories that clog you up. And so any of these so-called whole foods that people make and it has coconut oil in it is going to be raising the uh, the risk of heart attack, stroke, and by the way, also diabetes. And that's really important. Uh, I wrote a book, Diabetes Breakthrough, and also a paper on that. And it is the excess saturated fats that prevent the blood sugar from getting into the cells where it can be used for energy. And instead it stays in the blood and damages the brain and the eyes and the kidneys and the blood vessels too. So keeping that saturated fat, you can't avoid it all because even friendly avocados have a little bit, even those wonderful walnuts that Kim's having for breakfast have a little bit, but you just need to keep it down to 12 grams or under per day. And then you're doing pretty good. And that's very possible too. Thank you. Um, Victoria, your upcoming book is called Age Like a Yogi. What can yoga and Ayurveda and Ayurveda add to a whole food plant-based lifestyle, especially as it applies to youthful aging? Well, thank you for asking. I discovered yoga early on, and that was really why I initially became vegetarian. Back when I was a teenager, there were three books about yoga in the Kansas City, Missouri Public Library, and I read all of them over and over. And one thing that they all agreed on was that if you were going to be serious about yoga from a spiritual point of view, as well as to keep yourself healthy and be able to meditate for long periods, et cetera, you needed to be eating a plant-based diet. So that was something that's been part of my journey for a long time. Yoga is wonderful for um, calming the mind, for flexibility, for strength, for discipline, for feeling good about yourself. So you want to do all these wonderful things. And then I discovered Ayurveda quite a bit later. It was the early 1990s. And that was such a wonderful discovery for me. So for those who aren't familiar with Ayurveda, it's the sister science of yoga. They grew up alongside one another. Ayurveda is still recognized as a viable uh, mental discipline, medical discipline by the World Health Organization. And it's really come back uh, since um, India 
was no longer colonized by the British and they outlawed Ayurveda. So it's bounced back brilliantly. And what I love about Ayurveda probably more than anything else is that it's a way to tweak your lifestyle so you can customize it so that it works precisely for you. Because one of the things that really makes me sad is to run into somebody who says, oh yeah, I used to eat that way, but... And then they go on and they tell you, you know, maybe their stomach hurt or maybe they felt tired or maybe they just whatever. And it's so sad that they've gone back to the standard American way of living. And what Ayurveda can do, and certainly, you know, you tweak it, you adapt it, you make it your own. A lot of people look at Ayurveda and say, oh my gosh, they really like ghee, clarified butter, you know, and you're a vegan. It's like, yeah, so I don't do the butter, clarified or unclarified. So, you know, take what you like and leave the rest. But generally speaking, you can learn in Ayurveda what your body type is and how to just very gently, like for some people, the healthiest foods we can eat, we've been hearing this, you know, all week and we'll continue to, are, are these fabulous leafy greens and, and those greens from the cabbage family have phytochemicals that you can't get anywhere else. But if every time you eat them, your stomach hurts, you're going to think, wait a minute, there's something not right here. And in Ayurveda, they talk about ways that you can prepare foods differently so that it suits you. And what we want is for people to feel good as they're getting healthy. And so Ayurveda is great for that. And uh, that's what Age Like a Yogi is all about. Uh, yoga for the soul, Ayurveda for the body. And uh for every decade as we go forward. And just, just to share, this is kind of fun. I've dedicated my book to my first yoga teacher, Stella Churfus. She is in London. She's 98 years old. teaches one class a week. She lives in a fourth floor walk up and she's been plant-based since 1952. So I got a pretty good role model. How many books have you written? Uh, Age Like a Yogi will be my 14th. Great, cool, fantastic, great. Okay, Kim, um, Another barrier people have to eating plant-based is they say that it takes too much time. What are some tips for saving time so people have, don't have to live in their kitchen? Yeah, so it is definitely a learning curve if you aren't used to cooking, if you're used to everything coming out of a freezer and coming, you know, going through drive throughs and things like that. And, um, and that was kind of me, you know, I used to call myself the microwave meal mom because everything was frozen, prepackaged. I could barely boil water. You know, I just, I didn't cook. And so when I was first starting out, that was a big barrier for me. It was like, A, how I'm going to do this and B, like, how, how I'm going to find the time to do this. And so the biggest thing is, um, batch prepping ahead of time. It's like I mentioned the overnight oats, um, that we're all eating, well, I have mason jars that I line up and I do all our breakfasts at one time and they're in the fridge, grab and go. Um, you know, I'd make really big pots of soup. Um, I prep all of our fruits and veggies for the week. Um, I make my kids vegan mac and cheese for their lunches. Um, you know, I do everything I can efficiently. So it's really about being efficient with your time and prepping ahead as many as things as you can for the week. Um, whether it's some people do full meals or you can at least, at least just do some staples like, you know, roast some potatoes, bake some sweet potatoes, make some brown rice in your instant pot. Um, you know, making as if a lot of people have sweet tooth. So um, I, I always have some kind of sweet treat or dessert or snack ready and made for the week. Like uh, in my fridge right now, you can find um, some uh, sweet potato brownies and some uh, I think I have chocolate peanut butter, date balls. Um, so like little treats that my kids can, you know, I can put them in their lunches or they can snack on. Um, but I do that on usually Sunday, sometime on the weekend, but usually Sunday afternoon and few hours, get my husband to help, get my kids to help. 
Um, and, you know, we've got a ton of things made for the week. And so it's not every day. Oh my God, what am I going to make? What am I going to cook? I don't have any time. I'm too tired. Uh, let's just go through the drive through No, it's like you do have to plan ahead. So it's a little bit of learning curve if you're not used to doing that, you know, but if you plan ahead and you, it's really about making the healthy choice, the easy choice. I think I heard Rip say that on uh, Friday and I say that all the time as well. Make the healthy choice, the easy choice, you know, make it ready to go so that it's easy. You know, it's insight. All the healthy things are around. So you're going to want to grab those things instead of like, oh, I'm so tired. Let's just go through drive through. Um, so there's definitely things that you have to learn how to do, but it's, I mean, I don't spend my life in the kitchen all day long. I'm, I've got other things to do. I've got kids, you know, we're going and doing stuff all the time. So it's really about, you know, being efficient with your time. Thank you. Um, Steve, just to follow up on the last question, just so we're clear, you're saying you're recommending not to eat animal products. You're also recommending that we minimize saturated fat, even in plant foods. So that would mean, just to be clear, are you saying all coconut products like coconut yogurt, coconut ice cream? And what about macadamia nuts, Brazil nuts, cashews, which are all high in saturated fat? Um, what, are, what are you saying about those, just so we're clear? Well, yeah, for coconut products, uh, coconut oil is the heaviest with um, 82 to 94 percent saturated and uh, nothing of value. Uh, any yogurts or ice creams made with coconut oil, forget it. They have too much saturated fat, not enough good in them. For example, we've found some avocado ice cream that's very low in saturated fat, like one gram per serving. But it's hard to get 12 grams a day that way. Uh, so we just kind of watch it if it's a packaged food. And then as far as unpackaged foods, well, too much peanut butter would be too much. A little is okay. But, you know, if you get up to a quarter cup of peanut butter, then you're starting to get a little high in the saturated fats. And uh, chocolate's another one. We eat dark chocolate because that way we eat less chocolate and get the same satisfaction and less saturated fat. So we kind of try to keep that down. And uh, it's, it's fun, really. I mean, I've been plant-based for 54 years, Stephen. And when I started, you couldn't buy any junk food that was vegan. You had to make everything yourself, even tofu. They didn't even sell tofu in San Francisco back then. Just to be perfectly clear, though, cashews, macadamia nuts, and Brazil nuts, they're the highest three nuts in saturated fat. Are they still low enough that they're part of the diet? Or are you saying you recommend Okay, well, let's, let's look at an example. Cashews have vitamin E and a little bit of essential fatty acids. Macadamia nuts, just like coconut oil, has no vitamin E and no essential fatty acids. Macadamia nuts are purely for entertainment. They don't have any <laughs> nutritional value except calories. Um, they're fun, they're good. Uh, we have a couple trees, but we don't eat a lot of those because they're pretty worthless. Cashews, you can eat a few. The idea is just calculate it up. Make sure you don't get over your limit of saturated fat. And um, Brazil nuts, well, they have another problem. Uh, they tend to absorb radioactive particles from the soil. So they've fallen out of favor. And now people are eating, you know, no more than one a day for sure. Plus, they're very high in selenium to the point where you, if you eat more than one a day, you're going over your upper limit on selenium. Now, selenium is a valuable mineral, absolutely essential for glutathione peroxidase, which neutralizes antioxidation in the body. It's an antioxidant. So it's, it's good to have the right amount, but not too much. Uh, but cashews are less in saturated fat and not too scary to me. And, uh, you know, I, I have no problem eating five or six cashews with something. However, if you do, you're right. If you get into a cashew uh, ice cream, then it can be a little fatty and a little bit too much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Victoria and Kim, there was recently, very recently, an Oprah Winfrey special, and she was talking about obesity and she was saying it's a disease. Um, and it's a sensitive thing because it's really not a great thing to use this conference to make people feel blamed or shamed. So... <clears throat> Every time we say 
It's good not to have ice cream. The goal isn't to make people who eat ice cream feel bad. It's just to give them the facts and then everyone's on their own journey and will decide what's right for them. But um, I guess I guess let's ask two questions here. So one, um, I don't know, what, what do you make of this when Oprah's saying obesity is a disease? Do, is it an emotional, psychological thing? Or if people just switch to a whole food plant-based diet, would their bodies naturally lose weight? Um, do you have any thoughts on, on any of that, both of you? Well, I'm happy to jump in on that because I spent the first 33 years of my life battling obesity. And what I see is it is a disease but it's complicated. And I look at it in three ways, A, B, and C. A, I call that American. That's a problem of the food. That's the standard American diet. That's fast food. That's addictive food. For people whose problem stems from that, and they haven't gotten further along the emotional disease road, you give them this diet, you teach them how to cook, <laughs> you show them what a rutabaga is, and they're they're going to town, they're great. Then you've got your B people, and I call them baffled because they do know about nutrition. And they're usually women and they read the nutrition websites and whatever, but then maybe the boyfriend does something they don't like or the boss yells, and they're into the hagen das and they don't know why. And then it's in the emotional realm. And there's a lot of help for people like that, writers like Janine Roth, uh, most of the uh, kind of um, uh, people, the psychologists that work with people with eating problems, they have a really good understanding of that emotional piece. So you combine that with whole food plant-based and a little bit of behavior modification, self-love, self-care, and, and they're fine. But then we get to this third part C and that stands for compulsive. And this is when it's an addiction. And I think of it as like a rubber band. You can stretch the thing and stretch it and stretch it. But once it breaks, there's no going back. And that's when I believe that eating can be like, uh, like alcoholism. It's emotional, it's mental, it's spiritual, and it's physical. And I, for me, I think that we have to work on all levels when it's at that place. And I'm happy to report that in, in my life, it's been 40 years a day at a time since I last abused myself with a fork. But I agree with Oprah, it is a disease. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what you just said. That, and, and I do think it it is a disease, but and it is very complicated and multifaceted. And um, for different people and especially women and people who come to me and myself in general as well. Like I, I'm, I know I'm an emotional eater. That is something I've discovered about myself. And, um, part of why I love eating this way is because it, it, it does help kind of tamp down those, those feelings and those cravings. Um, and I can eat until I'm full. So I don't feel that, you know, restrictive, um, eating, um, that would cause like the yo-yo, you know, binge, you know, starve yourself binge and, you know, go back and forth. Um, and so for a, a lot of people, you know, you have the emotional side of it, the stress eating, and it's just everywhere, you know, all the junk food is just, you can't escape it. So it's, it's, you know, and I think a lot more people are probably food addicts than maybe realize, um, because it's, and it's so hard because it's, it's so accepted you know, you, you go, there's just junk food everywhere. And it's, I mean, it's in the gas stations, it's, you know, everywhere you drive. And it's like an alcoholic being surrounded by bars everywhere, <laughs> you know, everyone yeah. offering you a drink, have a drink, have another drink. Would you like a drink? And you can't escape it, you know? And so, but it's acceptable. So you go with it, you know, you think it's okay. Um, and I think that, you know, we're living in just the society of excess and so, and so it's just, it's just so multifaceted and it's just everywhere. And I think that for, you know, for myself, you know, eating this way has really helped me, you know, in a lot of ways, but still, even today, if, you know, I'm in a certain situation, I can be triggered by just seeing or smelling certain foods from my childhood. And it's like, I have to just take a minute and like process that and, uh, and stress eating still comes up for me too. And so it's just this constant, you know, 
progress, not perfection, doing the best you can every day. And so, yeah, I, I do agree that I think it's a disease, but I think that, you know, it's, it's very complicated, lots of different, you know, root causes for many different people. And it's just, it's something, you know, our society has just kind of gotten out of control with just the acceptance of just absolute trash food everywhere. Thank you. Unfortunately, it's not just obesity. Uh, just about every disease you can name has a self-induced aspect to it. And so what we can do is help people to recover from these problems. And it's nice because as you recover from one, you recover from the others. As you lose the, the weight, you lose the diabetes, you lose the heart disease risk, you know, you lose the clouded mind and because obesity itself increases inflammation in the brain and elsewhere. So it's nice because we can really basically cure the whole circle little at a time and as much as people are willing to. It's always hard for me and I'm sure it is for you that sometimes people don't wanna go as far as I know it would be good for them to go as far. So we just need to be patient. And once they get a little positive movement, you know, if somebody loses five pounds, they start feeling better about it and then they can lose another five and they just get a bigger smile. And it's the same way with dropping in, you know, meat is one of the most obesogenic foods there is. It's really high in calories and people don't realize it and they don't talk about it, but meat's a big culprit, especially for kids and childhood obesity is really rampant. Uh, Steve, regarding diabetes and blood sugar problems, um, you mentioned something about fat. So if you were trying to solve someone's high blood sugar, what is, are you, and they said they're already eating a whole food plant-based diet, would you now tell them, stop the avocados, stop the olives, stop the nuts and seeds? No, no? if they're trying to get their no, blood sugar- No, none of that. I would tell them to watch their saturated fat intake. And I sure have seen plenty of vegans who are chugging down coconut oil from one source and another to boost their, them up. The way it works is, in my book, Diabetes Breakthrough, explains this carefully and also an academic paper I wrote on it, that the saturated fats prevent the blood sugar from getting into the cells where it's needed for energy and keeps the blood sugar in the arteries where it can damage the eyes and the brain and the kidneys. And this is um, something that I think mainstream medicine has not really embraced. Yes, it's a good idea to eat slow-releasing carbohydrates, and the test of that is their glycemic load. And one of the sad parts about modern medicine with diabetes is they say no fruit because fruit has sugar. However, the low glycemic load fruits like apples and pears and berries of all kinds are very low glycemic load. They do not increase spikes in sugar, and they're very protective against the damage from oxidation and glycation that happens with diabetes. So it's a several pronged approach. You wanna keep those sat fats again under 12 grams per day. You wanna eat lots of low glycemic load fruits. Notice, do not use glycemic index, it's very inaccurate. And then you also wanna eat slow releasing carbohydrates like whole grains, but I mean really whole grains, not where it says whole grains on the front of a cereal package. <laughs> okay. Um, Victoria and Kim, um, do you want to talk about whole grains in a plant-based diet and dispel some of the myths about carbohydrates? Sure. I can, I can jump in with that one. Cause I know that's a question I get all this, all the time is people telling me, oh, I can't have all grains. It's going to spike my blood sugar, you know? And, you know, I have to do the same thing, explain like Dr. Blake has said, you know, that it's not the carbs, really, it's the fat, you know, if you can bring your fat down, then, you know, you're not going to have quite as much issue. Um, but really making sure that they're whole grains, you know, and really explaining what that means, um, you know, and eating closer to intact whole grains. So steel cut oats and old fashioned oats and, you know, limiting the the flours and the breads and making sure that, you know, they're 100% whole grain and, you know, reading labels and things like that. Um, but the other part of the whole grains is people also talk a lot about needing to be gluten-free um, and, you know, thinking they need to be gluten-free when they're not celiac and they're not actually gluten sensitive, but the whole gluten thing is kind of 
been blown out of proportion, kind of like the protein, you know, it's just, it's marketing at this point. They're just trying to sell gluten-free junk food. Um, so really kind of explaining that like, well, okay, if you're not celiac and you know, it's not, you're not gluten sensitive, it's not really bothering you. Then, you know, do you really need to be gluten-free? You know, probably not. Um, but, um, you know, just kind of explaining, you know, all of that and, and, taking, you know, whole grains are just so healthy. You know, the longest lived populations were eating whole grains and beans. Um, and so, um, yeah, whole grains are, are definitely a, a go and I eat them every day. And there's lots of whole grains out there too, to explore. We love to tell people to explore millet and buckwheat and oh, all the different rices like Weihane red rice. And they're just so many great grains to explore. And lots of great beans to explore too, both of which would be looked down as carbos by a paleo or keto guy. But, uh, and I sure agree with you that very few people are truly celiac or gluten sensitive. And a lot of people think they are, and it makes their life harder. Thank yeah. Um, if anyone would like to raise, uh, ask a question, just please raise your hands, click the hand icon in the reactions tab. Uh, Victoria, are we going to say something or should I go? Oh, I, I was just going to talk about what people say about carbohydrates and they'll say, oh, you know, it's those carbs that'll get you, you know, the, the pizza, the, the ice cream. And they're talking about food that gets most of its calories from fat, but they want to blame the carbs and to try to gently walk someone through the fact that complex carbohydrates are the primary fuel for humans and other primates, it's really like having to like undo a, a quilt and take away so many of the patches because they've been put on there for years and years and years that a carbohydrate is not an awful thing and in fact should provide the basis of our diet. Thank you. You need a sage stick or something <laughs> to make carbos clean again. Uh, Dr. Blake, um, Brian Clement from Hippocrates Health Institute, Hippocrates Wellness, is one of the very few people that says the fruit today has been hybridized. It's too sweet. It feeds yeast, mold, fungus, candida, cancer. And he's very, very um, against more than and none. He's saying none for people fighting a health challenge and 15% by weight for people that are healthy. So he's very much um, saying that the fruit is not okay. And then he's saying that Thomas Seifried from Boston College has also said that cancer's uh, fuel is glutamine and glucose. So most others, all other speakers that I've asked have said they don't agree and they think fruit is certainly a part of a whole food plant-based diet that's healthy. Uh, Brian continues to insist emphatically, he has the support of his wife and Gabriel Cousins, that the fruit is feeding these issues. Um, I love fruit. I'd rather he was wrong. Do you have any thought on this? Sure, of course. The trick is to look at the glycemic load of the fruit. And for berries, blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, they have a very low glycemic load. What that means is that if you eat a half a cup of these berries, your blood sugar will not go up much at all. And if your fats are good, they're going to get absorbed very easily. So no problem. Now, there are some like bananas that are heavily hybridized and very sweet. And it might be a good idea to stay away from eating much in the way of bananas if you do have some of these challenges where high glucose would be a problem. You know, I don't have a problem with it. Um, but fruit is different. You know, uh, a lot of people think that... Uh, well, bell peppers is a vegetable. No, it's a fruit, but it's very low in sugar. So is Brian saying, don't eat bell peppers? What about cucumbers? They're he's not okay. sweet, they're fruit. He's okay and with those. Well, sure. Um, and we are, after all, primates, and fruit is what we're genetically adapted to eat. So it makes sense for us to eat those. It does make sense to eat organic fruit instead of fruit sprayed with insecticides. I really think that's a good idea. And uh, it's a good idea. You know, you won't get all your nutrition from fruit, but for the brain, we want the anthocyanins in the dark 
purple, blue, red, black berries and grapes. And those really are wonderful for the brain. So I wouldn't want to cut those, but they're not going to spike blood sugar. So you have to look at what's going on. Also, you want to make it a difference between eating an apple and eating an apple pie from a convenience store. The apple pie from the convenience store is just loaded with sugar. And remember those? <laughs> and But the apple itself is very low glycemic load. So no problem at all. So, and also dried fruit can be high in sugar and fruit juices can be high in sugar. You have to be careful with those two. So the whole part is the important part. And certain of it, like mangoes can be too sweet for some people and bananas. And there's a few high on the glycemic load scale, but the rest of the fruit is great, fantastic, very protective. Those carotenoids that I think Kim mentioned um, are very protective, anti-inflammatory and, and brain protective. So there's so many good things in fruit. We don't want to throw out, you know, the baby with the bathwater. And there is an interesting study, um, the Global Burden of Disease Study, that looks at mortality and disability across various countries and, and ages. And they determined a few years ago that for the United States, the thing that we aren't doing enough of is eating fruit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we used that in our last review on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Dorothy, would you like to ask a question or where are you from? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Dorothy. I'm from New York. Uh, I have a question about the fruit. I think I heard Dr. Blake say that the glycemic index is not the same as the glycemic load. Glycemic and load. Like, yeah, and I know, you, but I think you said the index and the load are two different things. And I've seen Yes, they're two different of, things. The glycemic okay. index is very inaccurate. And the glycemic load is the one you want to look at only. Is there a table of? I've seen I've seen tables of glycemic index. I don't think I've seen one of load. That shows you which fruits have higher or lower load. Yeah, it, it's it's not the same at all. For instance, watermelon. If you look at watermelon, the glycemic index is really high because watermelon sugar absorbs very quickly into the bloodstream. But if you look at the glycemic load of watermelon, it's very low. Why? Because there's almost no sugar in the watermelon and a serving of it does not raise your blood sugar. So forget glycemic index. It's a mistake. I know a lot of doctors are still using it, but I'm a nutritional biochemist and I really know the difference. And, you know, I've written books and papers on diabetes. You don't want to go with that index. It's inaccurate. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> Can you tell it's a pet peeve? <laughs> uh, just one quick quick thing just to clarify. Um, hearts of palm in a can, is there a problem with that? Is that just a vegetable or is there saturated fat in it? They're very satisfying and they almost feel like, I don't, I don't see anything on the can that says saturated fat content. So do you know anything about that? They seem like a really good, satisfying snack. Um, do you know anything about what them? What is it called? Hearts of Hearts palm. palm. Usually they're really high in sodium. That's really the only thing you have to look at for the hearts of palm is they're very high in sodium. So make sure you rinse them really well to re remove, you know, some, as much of the sodium as you can. Okay. Um, okay. Continuing. Um, oh, you're talking about hearts of palm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, you, oh, you doubled up and I didn't quite get that. Parts of palm are actually pretty healthy. They do have a little sugar in them. They don't have a lot of the anthocyanins and good brain protective nutrients. So I would go with uh, berries and other fruit that be maybe a little healthier. But hearts of palms are fun. We get them live here out of the coconut trees and they're just amazing, fun to eat. Okay. Um, Kim and Victoria, uh could you share the pivotal studies or data points or books or speakers that were instrumental in shaping the conclusions that you presented in your works and your books? You know, what evidence did you find most compelling or transformative in your research process? Oh my gosh, so many. I mean, I, I guess I just have to go with my favorites um, because there's just so many studies that point to the same information. Um, 
for me, when I was first starting out, I started with Dr. Furman's work, works, um, his books, Eat to Live, uh, Super Immunity, that really piqued my interest of all the nutrition, um, nutrient dense foods and, and all the nutrition in it. And then all of Dr. Greger's works, you know, How Not to Die, How Not to Diet, now his new book, How Not to Age. Um, and his, his website is just a plethora of wonderful, well-broken down studies and videos on nutritionfacts.org. Um, the China study by Dr. T. Colin Campbell, love that one. Just um, so much about cancer, which, you know, when I was growing up, the C word was a scary word. And so reading his book just made me feel like, you know, I have so much power over not getting cancer or, you know, lowering my chances um, you know, reading all the studies with that. Um, I think those are probably just off the top of my head, some of my, my favorites, um, that I can think of. What about you, Victoria? Well, I'll talk about some of the, the teachers in our whole food plant-based space who've just been so influential in my life. I think what convinced me the most was simply doing it. It, it was an experiment of one. And since this, I'll just share this, since we were talking about coconut oil tonight, about 12 years ago, so I'd been plant-based for a very long time, so many people were pushing the coconut oil with, with so much energy. And a lot of people around me are completely oil-free. I'm not 100% oil-free. I'd use a little bit of olive oil. And I thought, you know what, just to shut these coconut oil people up, I'm going to use coconut oil for six months, just in the amounts that I've been using olive oil. Well, lo and behold, my perfect plant-based cholesterol for all these years went up to the level of an American, which was absolutely horrifying. And I just switched and went back to what I was doing before and it went back down. So sometimes those personal experiments are, are uh, pretty telling. But some of the people that I just admire enormously the people who kept me going, uh, Freya Dinshaw, the American Vegan Society, still very much alive, and, and her uh, late husband, Jay, believed in me when nobody else did. And uh, I think that's important for all of us. If it's like, oh, why, you know, this person I love, why can't they go plant-based? Well, let's believe in them. You know, let's just treat them as a pre-vegan. Um, and then uh, Dr. Michael Clapper was the first physician that I knew to come into our movement. We had lots of wonderful chiropractors, naturopaths, but he walked into Vegetarian Summerfest, this really tall guy, and somebody said he's a medical doctor. And it's like, whoa, it's all going to change now. Uh, Dr. Furman, as you said, Dr. McDougall came very early on and was really giving us that clinical expertise because he came to what he saw from what he observed in, in his patients. Uh, Dr. Campbell, as you mentioned, and, and his book, Whole, which I think sometimes gets overlooked because the China study was such a massive bestseller, but Whole really explains what we're all talking about about food that there's a synchronicity there's a synergy of, of these these nutrients and these elements working together in in the whole food and certainly christy funk who you had on yesterday so so wonderful for women so i think that all all the great uh, teachers and doctors we have out there are really role models and if it's okay i just want to go over here in the chat because this, this lovely person, Amy, has asked this question a couple of times. Uh, she's asking about coconut mana and cultured ghee. And I don't really know what either of those are. I just know that I avoid coconut and I avoid ghee. Does anybody want to address coconut mana and cultured well, ghee? The question that just came up also asked about coconut oil rubbed on the skin. And I actually looked into that. Oils are absorbed. And the saturated fat is absorbed. And what's also interesting is that if you rub a quarter cup of coconut oil on your body, you're not only going to get way too much saturated fat, but guess what? A whole lot of calories goes along with that. It's going to fatten you up too. So what? I use a better skin oil. Yes. I see. I didn't know that because people would ask me, "Oh, you know, can I put it on my skin?" I'm like, oh, "Sure, why not? It's moisturizer." But I did not know. Yeah, I looked into it. The studies on it were mostly on kids and babies, where they would test them after they rubbed it on, and it was clear that the oil is absorbing right into the bloodstream and then actually adding calories and weight. Oh my gosh! 
Wow. And then Carol has just put in the chat. So what kind of oil is best for your skin? And I know this is controversial because there are so many different ways of looking at skincare, but Ayurveda loves sesame oil, natural That's sesame oil, choice. not the roasted kind for, you know, a few drops for flavor, but this, this is, is pure um, organic sesame oil. You can even get herbalized oil and you can use this as a skin moisturizer. It's the only skin night cream or anything like that I use, just sesame oil. And also there's a wonderful practice of rubbing warm sesame oil on your whole body and letting it absorb and then being really careful. You don't want to slip and fall, um, but then you know wiping the oil off your feet and getting in the shower. And it's just a wonderful way to, to give yourself a sense of calm through the day to feel warmer in the winter and really notice that that rough flakiness, you know, like you take off your your black uh, tights and you look and it's like, Ooh, what, what's all that white stuff? You know, that's your skin that when you were, you know, maybe younger, like a child, you know, it just took care of itself so naturally. And then time passes and we can use a little sesame oil. Um, let me ask another question, Steve. Um, Nina Heischeltz in the Big Fat Surprise, the book, The Big Fat Surprise, questions the claimed link between saturated fats and heart disease due to inconclusive evidence, critiques <laughs> the health impact of low fat, high carb diets, defends the importance of fats for health, points out misinterpretations in fat related nutritional studies, and disputes cholesterol as the main cause of and disputes cholesterol as the main cause of heart disease. Is well, of course, clear, it's not. It's a marker for heart disease. Right. Is there clear evidence that saturated fats from animal products are linked to heart disease? Well, I could easily forward you a thousand peer-reviewed excellent studies that show that, yes. Uh, I think the evidence is completely clear on that. And I know some people, especially some meat eaters, really want it not to be true. And there's some kind of made-up stories about it. But uh, clinically, it's clear as a bell, uh, too much saturated fat. And I actually write about this in my book on no more heart attacks. Um, and I talk about it in detail, how that comes about that the saturated fats do that and how it affects cholesterol production in the liver and, and all that. Um, so it's, yeah, no, there's no doubt at all that high levels of saturated fat increase risk of heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, vascular dementia, and diabetes. Okay, thank you. Okay, final question. Uh, Victoria and Kim, how do you suggest dealing with social and family pressures when shifting to plant-based eating? I'll let you go first, Victoria. Okay, you know, I think it's really just to be nice and to understand that people see the world differently and people are where they are. And it's this lovely, gentle balance of this is my conviction and I'm sticking to it. And for me, of course, it's for health. It's also for animals. It's all for, for the environment. But if somebody says to me, why do you do this? And it's over a meal, I'm not going to tell them all the reasons why I do it. There was a, a gentleman called Jim Lennon who um, ran the Natural Hygiene Society, now the National Health Association for a long time. And people would say to him, well, what's wrong with eating meat? And he'd say, no, nah, I don't think much is wrong with it. And they'd say, well, how long has it been? He'd say, uh, 23 years. And then the person would keep coming back and want to ask more questions. I believe in something that I call attraction activism. If you have something other people want, they'll do what you did to get it. So live your best life have fun. You know, sometimes we forget that we're in such a hurry. We're trying to be so healthy and we're trying to be so ethical and we're trying to do all this stuff that we forget to have fun. But you want to kind of have, you know, some balance and some lightness and just let people see that this is a good thing and maybe they'll want it too. And also the family is the hardest. So if you feel like you just have to go out and convert all the strangers, do that first. Your family's watching too. Yes. Uh, that's awesome. Go ahead, go ahead. 
Yeah, I was going to totally agree with, with all of that. You know, being the example is so much more powerful than preaching, um, and especially to family. You know, I don't, I don't go to the family barbecue. I bring my vegan food with me, and I don't like preach or anything. I just eat it. <laughs> and but I think for a lot of people, the social aspect is trying to please other people. You know, if you know people start questioning them, family members and things like that. So you have to love yourself enough to set boundaries and say, no, this is, this is how I'm going to eat. This is, I'm doing this for myself and for my health or for whatever reasons. Um, and not let people, you know, make you feel guilty or make you feel bad or push you around or, you know, question your, your motives. You know, it's, you have to love yourself enough to say, I'm important. You know, I'm not going to just eat what you're having to please you. You know, I'm going to do this for myself. And that's, I think for a lot of people is the hardest part of the social aspect is fitting in and, you know, being different um, and wanting to, you know, fit in, you know, with society and, and doing something different. Yeah, And when we counsel people on dietary change, we like to have the whole family in the clinic. We've had ridiculous number of people in little clinic rooms. Uh, all talking about the food because the family can move as a group. And if they get, if they know they're supporting grandma to get her memory back, they may be more willing to change. Thank you. Okay, one more question. Katie, where are you from? And would you like to ask a question? Okay. Yes, hi, I'm from Virginia. My question is there is Uh, we lost you, Katie. Try again. She put it in the chat, too. Okay, hey, go ahead. Go ahead, Katie. Say, yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a huge hype for childbearing aged women such as myself about having to increase their fat intake um, for fertility. Can you speak some on this? I'm also postpartum, so I also heard that, you know, for your mental health as well, you're supposed to increase your omegas. Um, so just looking for further intake on that. I'm not sure I quite understood the question. You're thinking of increasing your fat intake. Is that the idea? She's saying there's a big push for women of childbearing years needing to increase their dietary fat. Can you speak to this? Was her first question. Well, it's true that um, women do need more calories. And remember, there are two essential fatty acids that humans need. Linoleic acid, the omega-6, and in about six to eight grams a day, and alpha-linolenic acid, the essential omega-3, and need that two or three grams a day. Those are the only fats that humans need. If you're thinking about gaining weight, there are many ways to do it, um, but eating a lot of fat may not be the best way to do that. I think that some of the Western price thinking and, and, and some of the paleo thinking has contributed to this. The idea that, um, that fertility depends on fat, that brain health, which you can address so well, doctor, depends on, on fat. And I, I don't know what that's based on, but maybe you could explain it a little bit. <laughs> well, the brain is the fattiest part of the body, isn't it? Um, our brain does need those essential fatty acids. And um, our brain also needs us to be healthy enough to make our own EPA and DHA for the brain or to take it in from say an algae-based supplement. So one way or the other, our brain is gonna need those long chain omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, I prefer to make it myself rather than take it because it's generally rancid if you get it in a pill. Uh, I eat flax powder with my soaked oats and that's a great way to get enough alpha linolenic acid, the plant-based omega-3 to help your brain out. Uh, as far as eating a lot of other fats, well, I eat whole intact avocados and olives and nuts, but I try not to eat any of the extracted oils because they're uh, so lacking in so many things that were taken out of the original seed or fruit. Okay, so uh, thank you all very much. Uh, Steve, how do we stay in touch with you if we want to speak to you or get your books or get your information? What's the best way? 
my website is drsteveblake.com. Just Joe simple www.drsteveblake.com. I have many, many books on that website and you can email me at steve at drsteveblake.com. And that's the best way to get in touch with me. I'm on the West coast of Mexico now and uh, we'll be back in Maui in a week or so. Fantastic. Um, and Kim, what's the best way to follow up with you and your work? Yeah, uh, so my website is simplyplantbasedkitchen.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you can, I think the handles are both the same, Simply Plant Based Kitchen. Um, so you can follow me there. Um, if you have any further questions or want to get in touch with me, you can email us at hello at simplyplantbasedkitchen.com. And Victoria, how would we follow up with you and stay in touch with you? Hi, everybody. Um, I am Victoria Moran, author on uh, Facebook and Instagram, and you can find me also uh, at Main Street Vegan. Uh, the websites are MainStreetVegan.com if you're interested in finding out more about uh, Main Street Vegan Academy and everything else. So my, my writing stuff is VictoriaMoran.com, and uh, it's wonderful to know you. I hope to get acquainted with everybody. Okay, can we unmute the audience so we can thank our panelists? Thank you all very much for being part of our conference. We appreciate all your hard work gathering this information and freely sharing with us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank and it's you. nice to meet you both, Kim and Victoria. You yeah, too. Very much. It's been wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Bye you. all. Thank you, Thank you Bye Steve. Bye. Thank you. Bye.